Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shama Venkateshwar. I'm the director of the public policy program at Roosevelt House Hunter College and distinguished lecturer. Welcome to our program's Wednesday afternoon seminar series. Today's panel discussion focuses on election 2020, insights on activism from Gen Z. This is a timely discussion which will outline what young voters care about and their positions on some of the most critical uh, challenges that face us, like the current pandemic and its impact, racial injustice, immigration, the economy, mass shootings, climate change, police violence, to name just a few. Gen Z members, interestingly, are those that are born after 1996, but are the most racially diverse and digitally connected generation in the United States. So their views matter as they can help to shape the political landscape. And it is within this generation of young activists, and we have seen many examples of their activism across the country, that we will find the country's next set of leaders. So we have a terrific lineup of speakers today who are fiercely committed to activism and social change. So let's hear from them. If you'd like to ask a question, so just some housekeeping, please type it on the chat box below or raise your hand. I'm going to start by asking each speaker to make some opening comments for no more than one minute, please on the big issues facing the electorate from each of their vantage points. Uh, let me start with Jake Martinez, Director of Youth Programs at the New York Civil Liberties Union. Jake, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me, everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm Jake Martinez. I'm the Director of Youth Programs at the New York Civil Liberties Union. Um, we're the New York State affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. And I oversee our youth organizing programs from the K-12 and college level. Um, I would say there's two major issues right now that are at stake, especially right now in the time of COVID. Um, the first one is election integrity and voter suppression. Um, the NYCLU as an organization has been seeing and hearing um, from folks in the community about issues with polling locations being closed or not accessible, um, phony mail and ballot bo drop boxes, um, confusion around m registering to be a poll monitor um, and other issues. And so we're also concerned um, by some of the comments that were made by the Trump administration um, that they may not accept the results of the election if they're not in Trump's favor. And this is really concerning for for the for everyone, really, um, and alarming. And so we, along with the National ACLU, are prepared to take action should this happen. Um, the other issue I would say that's that's really important is education. We need to elect people in power that support equal access to education, especially during a global pandemic, um, and that understand the harmful effects of high stakes testing, the impact that a lack of remote devices has um, on students and teachers and families. And so right now. Um, our state and our country is seriously lagging in providing students with an adequate remote um, education and the devices and the support that they need. And so we need to vote um, for people in power that will support our young people and, um, and really put a plan in place that will um, protect uh, students' right to education. Jake, many thanks. I'm going to turn to Devashish Basnet, a student at Roosevelt House in both the Public Policy and Human Rights Program. Uh, Devashish. Thank you so much, Professor, for having me today. And, and thank you so much uh, for the Roosevelt House for having me. I think there are a lot of different issues that are at stake uh, in this election in particular. And I think one thing that um, Gen Z is very keen on, um, focusing on that exact aspect, Professor, that you mentioned, that we are the most racially diverse uh, generation that in history, right? And with that comes a lot of nuances. One of those nuances being immigration is so intertwined in our lives in several different ways, right? Uh, and policy 
policies, immigration policies in particular, especially uh, ones passed forward by, by this particular administration, manifest themselves in a lot of ugly and, and horrific ways. And, the po and policies, immigration policies, have very real and direct impacts on students, on families, on workers across the country, especially. And so paying attention to this particular issue going forward for the next four years, right, even regardless of who's elected, is really important because we have to watch the United States as they're redefining their commitment to uh, international law and as they're redefining what the immigration systems look like in the United States, right? Um, we know that 800,000 DACA recipients futures rest on this election. We know that 11 million undocumented immigrants futures rest on this election. And, and there's a lot that's there's a lot at stake. And I'm really interested and excited to see what else um, we can unpack today. Devashish, thank you. I'm going to turn to Raisa Lynn Garden Lucerne, now a student at Roosevelt House in the Public Policy Program. Raisa. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm Raisa. I'm a senior CUNY BA student um, studying urban environmental health. Um, I'm the director of diversity at Box the Ballot, a great um, youth led uh, voting rights and a voting accessibility um, nonprofit org. Um, and this election cycle, I've got a couple things. I mean, a lot of things in mind, but the top three for me definitely are um, as an urban environmental health major climate change. Um, that's sort of a looming threat that affects the whole world. It's not just the United States. Um, and I think that's something when we look at um, the United States planning to pull out of the Paris Accord is something that's super important. And I really hope that we don't do that. Um, so that's definitely one of the issues that I will be voting on and, and trying to raise awareness around. Um, systemic racism, especially against black indigenous people of color is another big issue, uh, especially when we talk about policing and police reform um, or abolition as it's another thing that's on the table. Um, I also really do feel and I have been studying the ways in which race and climate change interact in the context of environmental racism, whether it's on the community level or in on a global scale, um, as climate change is posing more threats to smaller islands and the global south. Um, and finally, immigration reform. I just think we have to get kids out of cages and reunite them with their families. So thank you. Hey, sir, thank you. I'm going to turn to Zenzile Tonge, who's a student at Hunter College and a member of the Welfare Rights Initiative. Zenzile. Hi, thank you for having me. So I'm currently a senior at Hunter College. I'm a sociology and dance minor. I'm currently the, well, I'm currently the president and I'm the founder of the Black Student Union at Hunter College. And as um, Shima mentioned, I'm also a Welfare Rights Initiative member. Um, some of the core issues that um, I'm passionate about is, as um, Raisa had mentioned, was bringing racial equity, bringing socioeconomic equity, um, and especially um, pinpointing police brutality and how that's affecting our community and whether we should divest um, in the NYPD and also education, as Jake mentioned, and how um, systematic racism plays a role in that, or even um, economic, um, the lack of economic resources affect and impact certain communities um, trying to obtain education. Thank you. And our final uh, panelists who we want to hear some opening remarks from Leslie Vasquez, who's a student at City College. Leslie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Leslie Vasquez, and I am a junior at City College. I'm majoring in international studies with a focus in public policy, and I'm also minoring in economics and environmental science. Um, my main focus for today's political climate is to focus on um, incorporating social and environmental justice in today's policies. Um, I don't think that there's enough being done, and whichever candidate we choose and um, choose to advocate for, I think that this is something that we need to advocate more, a little more heavily, um, just to have a more sustainable and equitable environment and nation for everyone. Leslie, thank you very much. So let me ask you all a follow-up question, please. You know, it, during our discussions, we have talked heavily about voter empowerment, voter engagement. So from your sort of point of view, how do you build a broad coalition of student activism, student power? What tools do you have in hand as you look out and look at all the spaces that require organizing around? How do you empower a youth movement? 
Let me start, please, with Jake. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this one is a really exciting question for, for me to answer because as um, overseeing youth programs um, in, the, in the NYCLU Education Policy Center, um, we've seen, you know, when we're, when we're advocating for issues that impact folks, um, especially students, we want to work with them directly. Um, and so we have a number of youth organizing initiatives um, and we work through K-12 and college level. And so that's where we really start by building our movement is with the young people and they lead our curriculum development. They lead um, the trainings and workshops that we deliver to the community. And so I really believe that starting there and starting from, um, from folks who are most impacted is important. And I think that our organizing programs and initiatives are where we really begin to build those relationships and expand on our work. Um, I also think that having um, a coalition of like-minded organizations is important. So other folks who work on education related issues or environmental issues, um, it is important to, to connect and to work together, um, particularly to support existing legislation or build on new legislation. Um, so for us, that's really where we, where we really harness our, our efforts in programs and, and, and strategy initiatives. Jake, thank you. Devashish, what does student power mean for you? I think, yeah, that's a great question. I think student power manifests itself in a lot of different ways. And I think something to remember is that um, we as Gen Z recognize, uh, I think more than any generation that every single system in this country is entrenched with white supremacy, right? And, and it manifests itself in, in a lot of different forms. And to build student power, right, the most important thing is to center the most appropriate voices, which Jake had alluded to, and the most exciting organizing, the most exciting activism, the most exciting student organizing always comes from following leadership of, of those individuals that are most affected by the issues that we're advocating for. So that's centering Black and Indigenous voices, that's centering people of color voices when appropriate. And, and, and in order to engage and build that broad coalition, that broad leadership coalition, you have to center the most appropriate voices. Great, right. So where does sort of voter engagement and voter empowerment uh, kind of, how does it play out in the organization that you work with? Yeah, so at Box the Ballot, we have this really cool sort of like incentive program um, for our ballot box captains who sign up through our, um, through our website to sort of be the power and change in their community, right? So these youth sign up for a ballot box so that they then can have members of their community. Um, and what we used to have um, box the ballot be used as is for specifically college campuses. And, you know, so that students could place their absentee ballots um, in these boxes and then the box ballot, sorry, excuse me, the ballot box captain could then send them out. So at box the ballot specifically, we have incentives like uh, for every 10 um, ballots you collect, uh, you get stickers. Uh, for every 50, it's a shirt. For every 100, you get a gift card. And, and then once you hit 500, you get baked goods for your community. So I think incentives is a really important thing. And I also do think that right now, in a time where it kind of feels almost hopeless, where we have the rhetoric coming from this administration around a not so peaceful transition, I think it's important to empower youth to feel like they can, their voice has value and that their actions can bring change, right? So with a simple sort of initiative, like having a ballot box in your neighborhood, whether you're a member of a community nonprofit or you are a student living in a dorm, for example, here in like the Hunter dorms, you have the power to do something as simple as collect people's ballots and send them in. And so that everybody in your community can feel empowered to vote because that's I think a big thing right now is students don't feel empowered to vote um, and don't feel as though it matters anymore. Great, thank you. I, I think we lost Zenzile, but hopefully she's reconnecting. Leslie, let me ask you, please, what is a, you know a br building a coalition for student power mean for you? Well, I think it's a platform where students should feel like they belong into the voter. Um, um, area, I would say. Um, so the young and student body is the young, um, the lowest voter turnout that we see in elections. And I think it's important to empower young people that are able to vote um, to actually make a change because they feel like they, their vote is not going to make a difference or they feel like they're not educated enough to make a difference. So I think that empowering these students in knowing that these areas of, um, of voting and of importance is in their level, is to their reach. 
And I think that when we do that, we can have tons and tons more people, not just voting in New York City, not just voting in colleges, um, but to vote everywhere around the United States and to vote anywhere that doesn't include a college campus. Um, so I think that having these areas being open to young people and to students and of uh, vul the vulnerable people, people of color, and it doesn't have to be young people necessarily, um, but everyone should feel empowered to know that their vote is going to make a, everyone's difference in the voter turnout. Um, so I think it's super important for us to make everyone feel accepted and for everyone to feel like they belong in a place that makes them make a difference. Great. Thank you. Welcome back, Zensili. I'm going to continue to my next question. You know, the biggest challenge, obviously, of our times that we're all facing uh, at CUNY and uh, in New York City and elsewhere across the world is the crisis of COVID and its impact. And what we have seen here in the United States is all our existing structural inequity, inequities, our disproportional impacts uh, on the poor, on the vulnerable, on communities of color have just laid bare, right? All these tensions that used to exist have always existed. We are now seeing it, it is so apparent. So how do you all think, um, you know, when you approach organizing, voter engagement, building, you know, youth, a youth movement for voting and being, having our elected representatives being held accountable, how do you see the impact of COVID impinging on your work? So let me start with Zenzile, please. Thank you. So with COVID-19, we, as um, Shima, Shama had mentioned, we saw the racial disparities and how it, ha it has affected um, communities of color greatly. So we can even start at education and look at education where um, a lot of schools, especially public schools, the public school systems have a lack of funding. So a lot of students have went without Wi-Fi, stable Wi-Fi. I just had a Wi-Fi issue. Um, there was a lot of students that have um, the lack of access to um, devices and gadgets to have access to certain um, academic resources that they have to obtain. Um, we also look at overall just how certain um, students are fighting to stay in school. Um, I know the Black Student Union tried to advocate for that at school and just tried to put, um, one of our members put together a forum where um, a lot of students were documenting that they had issues just joining back in school because they didn't have the funding to pay um, college tuition to come back for a semester. So those are some of the key examples of how COVID-19 has affected us. Great, thank you. Debashish. Yeah, I think it's really important to talk about the pandemic, especially recognizing that I think um, the, this administration and the U.S. response to the pandemic has been more so to adapt and live with COVID-19 rather than defeat COVID-19, right? Whereas we've seen other countries have moved forward um, and have progressed like much more quickly than we have, right? So with that comes a lot of issues, right? Because students um, feel hopeless, right? The COVID-19 impacts every single aspect of our life. And it's so, it's difficult to ask students to give up their time. It's difficult to ask students to devote energy elsewhere when they're being pulled apart from so many different directions. And I think that's what, what this speaks to, right? A lot of politicians, a lot of elected officials, a lot of folks are, are begging to return to normal and, and begging to um, sort of find normalcy in these unprecedented times, that phrase that we heard a million times within the last few months. Right. But in this in this conversation about begging to go back to normal, we we all Gen Z especially recognize that normal was never OK. Normal was always entrenched with white supremacy. Normal was always unequal. Right. And so post pandemic, we don't want to return to normal. We want new. We want to envision a new world. And that and, and voting is one toolkit as a part of our um, uh, path to envision that new world. Um, and so the COVID-19 pandemic definitely did expose those inequalities, uh, but it's ne definitely not going to let us uh, get further in where we need to be. Great, thank you. I want to encourage our listeners, viewers to ask questions via the Q&A chat, the Q&A function. You can also raise your hand um, and then we would be able to call on you. Um, I want to please turn to Leslie with that same question um, on COVID and its impact and what the impact has been uh, for you 
uh, when you envision uh, voter registration, voter engagement, building a broad coalition of student movements? Sure. Um, so I think that with COVID, I think it makes um, voting definitely a little bit or a lot different. Um, a lot of people are scared to go into actual voting sites and vote themselves because there's a huge risk. So there's obviously that restriction and there's that um, there's that fear that we might not have as many voters actually vote when the time is needed to elect a candidate. Um, however, with the proper information and the proper preparement for um, early voting or um, just having voting ballots sent at home to then put them in um, the mailing boxes and whatnot, I think it's important to educate everyone to that these options are available. And I think that there's there might be, might be two outcomes. Let's hope for the better one. But the first outcome could be that people aren't going to vote because they're scared of the virus. And then the other one, which I hope is going to be the case, is that more people will vote because they have that option. People who are disabled and can't vote in this, like and can't go to voting sites. Um, people who are sick and aren't able to leave their homes. People who are um, who can't leave their homes for whatever reason. I think it could be a great turnout for this um, voting election. And um, I think that COVID could definitely be a restriction and could definitely place fear into all the voters. But I think it could benefit us to a certain extent. So um, we might have a couple of voters that aren't going to vote this year because of COVID, but we, we might also have new voters to have a new voice into these elections. Leslie, thank you. Jake, from your vantage point at the NYCLU, how has COVID and its kind of ongoing crises, you know, how has it constrained what you do in terms of getting folks organized, mobilized, getting the issues out there and building awareness? Yeah, I think it completely changed the way we run our organizing programs and the ways that we engage with the community. I think it's been a real, in the beginning, it was a real struggle. Um, we've sort of adapted to the times um, with all of our different programs, whether we're organizing um, young people, older folks, um, we are doing everything virtually. Um, as you can see, we're having this awesome panel discussion on Zoom. Like we've done virtual rallies, virtual press conferences. Um, any kind of virtual function um, that you can think of, we've tried to really be engaging. I think part of the issue that we've encountered is that when we're organizing, organizing is about building relationships and it's really hard to build a relationship from a computer screen. So we're just trying our best to um, keep folks engaged. When we had our high school program last year, you know, when, when COVID hit, um, we were anticipating that we were going to lose a lot of participation from young people, but when this happened, we actually had, you know, so many young people stuck around for the entire school year because they were so passionate about the work that we're doing and they really wanted to to be engaged in the work. Um, and so that was really that was really uh, you know, it was really nice to see that to see that engagement happening. Um, and also, I, I, I just want to echo some of the thoughts that have um, been shared here about the virus and the situation happening really just amplifying or, or bringing awareness to issues that already existed because with our with our issues in, in schools like we already know that a lot of issues are were happening with students being able to access their education right whether it's through a remote device or not but the pandemic really highlighted a lot of the problems that we that we already knew existed and that includes issues um, with school discipline, right? And when we were when we were talking to our young people and we were learning from students across the state about issues that were happening, now we're seeing, um, you know, students being disciplined for not having their cameras on during class, students being suspended and put into a Zoom detention room. I mean, we're really seeing new issues that you wouldn't have even thought of before. New ways to funnel students into the school to prison pipeline, which I think is really um, troubling for us. And so those are issues that we're looking to address in the upcoming year with our students and with our um, with our policy and legal team as well. Jake, thanks for that. I hope very much we'll have a chance to speak about that in, in a, you know, 
uh, throughout our discussion today about the impact of COVID and its disproportional uh, you know, effects on children of color, on how children are accessing K through 12, and then of course all the inherent tensions that, that uh, continue to perpetuate and find in fact new ways of, of manifesting itself. Right, so before we turn to the audience, one last uh, question to you about you know, COVID and its intersections and where you see your work lying in those tensions. Yeah, I mean, I think for starters, I think it's great. And I think that I'm seeing a lot of uptick in youth led organizations and youth led movements. I think for the longest time, ageism is really apparent. People think that because you're still a college student and you don't have any job experience that you can't do something. And I think that, you know, us at Box the Ballot and like various other organizations that that's actually not the case. The youth, and I think that's even seen how in our education system, we look at younger children not knowing anything. I think the youth have a really powerful say and even sway in how elections can turn out, right? Because we're experiencing the ways in which the system is start, is start has been, but is even more so now crumbling, right? The, things are not working the way that they should. We have a voting system that's archaic. We have an education system that's archaic that still thinks that testing is an effective way to measure intelligence and measure retention. We've got healthcare that's still, you know, during a COVID pandemic, there are people who are left without healthcare and can't get the proper care that they need. I think that here at Box the Ballot, on top of you know, initiating um, ba ballot, ballot, excuse me, ballot box programming, we also work on voter information, right? And so I'm working currently on a pamphlet um, to be given out to um, a certain, I can't name yet, but a certain um, politician who will at her office have these pamphlets on various uh, voting issues, like the one I'm writing right now is on um, Latinx issues, immigration, um, resources, and things of that matter. So I think, you know, there's, there's a very strong, I think, bond. And I think that also comes from the power of social media. Granted, social media is like a double-edged sword, right? But I think what we've seen in the TikTok community is that people really love to exchange information. There's a really, just because it's on social media doesn't, in some context, doesn't make it any less valid. I, I think that you know, here at Box the Ballot and other organizations, we are really, really utilizing youth energy and, you know, the one that's left because I think we also have a lot of sympathy for people nowadays. You know, we're kind of tired of the idea that you have to work hard, grind hard to get to where you need to be. I think there's a really strong coalition and, and partnership that's starting to arise around the idea that we're actually all in this together and we need, <laughs> we need each other to get forward and to move places. Um, and, and that's why I think that the youth movement is just so beautiful because if we look in the past too, it's the young people who are always asking for change and demanding change. And that's gonna keep happening until we get to a place where everybody, because the youth see all the discrepancies across the board and all the inequalities, you know, to where we wanna get to be, so. I said thank you. So I want to turn to the audience. I see some questions that have come on the chat uh, box. So folks, if you, those of you who have typed in your questions, we would be happy to turn on your microphone to have you uh, speak those questions out if you wish. Please look at an email, uh, the, the chat that you received from Peter Sclafani asking your permission to turn on your camera or not. But I'm going to have Peter read out Alex Fish, Alexis Fisher's question, please. So Peter, if you would turn your camera on. Hi, everybody. Thank you again for joining. This question comes from one of our students, Alexis Fisher. She says, hi, I really appreciated Davishus' sentiments around immigration, and he brought some really important points to the table. I'm wondering, Davishus, if you could speak to how ICE, the police, and the institutional violence that they perpetuate are interconnected and what we should do to pressure politicians to divest and abolish from uh, harmful policing and prison systems. 
Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Alexis. I think it's a really, really important one. And I think um, what happens when we talk about ICE, especially protests that were going on within the past, that are still going on right now. Um, we heard a lot of reports, uh, whether it was in Portland or or other states across the country, of, of unmarked vans sort of uh, snatching protesters and, and sort of um, uh, deputizing the National Guard and all of these sort of new layers that are, that are coming on. But it's really important to remember that this has already been going on in the country. ICE has been doing this exact thing to undocumented migrants um, for the past few years uh, under the Obama administration, as well as under the Trump administration. So it's really important to notice how interconnected these systems are, whether it's policing, whether it's prison, uh, whether it's prisons, whether it's whether it's uh, immigration, right? There, There is so much overlap and intersectionality within these issues. So it's important to see also how your own institutions play a role. So um, there are incredible organizations, whether it's uh, the Black Student Union of CUNY, uh, whether it's CUNY for Abolition and Safety, there are incredible organizations doing some awesome work of forcing our own institutions and holding up a mirror against CUNY, against colleges, against other institutions that may be participating in upholding these same systems, whether it's funding uh, prison uh, funding products that are purchased through prison labor, whether it's uh, whether it's participating in the system, right? Colleges, institutions, um, organizations all play a vital, vital role in how they want to uplift or support suppress sort of these gross inequities that we're seeing. So thank you so much for bringing that, that intersectionality up. It's really important. Any discussion about policing, about abolition, about, about these, these structures all comes from one place, about dreaming and envisioning a new world, a better world. Thank you. Uh, Peter, next question, please. Your sound. Thank you. This next question comes from Diamante Amelia Ortiz who writes, one of the big things about Gen Z is self-care and taking time to reflect during these unprecedented times. So for the panel, what are your go-to self-care tips this election cycle that you've learned from your fellow Gen Z folks? I'm gonna start with Raisa for that. Raisa, if you would start. Hi, hey Dimo. Um, Dimo's one of my friends. She's one of my sister activists fighting the good fight with me. Um, I think, and Dimo and I have actually had this conversation before, so I'm glad she brought it up. Um, I think unplugging is one of the best ways you can practice self-care. I did a social media cleanse for about two, three months after the video surfaced of Ahmaud Arbery shooting. I think that right now the media loves trauma porn. The media loves to show black bodies being, having violence done upon against them by the police or by you know, crazy racist people. And I got tired, I couldn't do it. It was just emotionally taxing. So I think, and something that I went through is, you know, recognizing that, wow, I feel, I feel almost guilty unplugging because I feel like I'm not doing what I need to be doing. I'm not, you know, sharing information that can keep, keep, keep people informed. But it was actually, it did the exact opposite. It actually forced me to go out and read more news as opposed to just scrolling through my timeline and getting news from there. It forced me to read and watch the news. It forced me to talk to other people um, you know, who've been to protests. I personally was, I wasn't able to, I was only able to go to one because I live with vulnerable people um, to COVID-19. So I had to be extra safe, but, you know, unplugging is, is a really good way to sort of cleanse all the, the sensory information that we're getting constantly that can be traumatic and, and, and draining. Um, I think to, you know, taking time to be with the friends that you, you do activism with and you do discourse with to actually take some time to sort of relax. <laughs> I think oftentimes as activists, we feel so compelled to keep fighting, to keep fighting. But if we don't replenish our energy, then you get to a point where you can't even help others because you're not helping yourself. I could just actually direct that same question uh, to a couple of more folks. And Zile, what what is self-care in these, in this very kind of harsh times that we're living in mean for you? Especially with um, COVID-19 being at the forefront of our lives right now, it is important to bu um, build your immune system, get your rest, move one, move one time a day. Like I usually, um, when I, first thing when I wake up, I try to wake up early around 7, 7.30. Um, I go running for like one to two miles a day. I try to practice meditative practices like yoga and breathing in and out and just really trying to center myself. I think it's important that we take our time to recharge and work on ourselves. 
like Raisa um, mentioned, like if we're not recharging ourselves, how can we help one another? How can we help um, other people? And also just eating right as well. I think as a college student with having Zoom classes back to back, sometimes we might forget to eat. And that is important with like building our immune system and keeping ourselves energized. Thank you very much. I want to turn to my colleague, uh, Delona Lewis from the Welfare Rights Institute I wonder, initiative. I wonder if, Delona, you're able to turn on your microphone and ask your question directly. Yes, I'm Hi, here. Hi, Delona. Can you hear me? Yes. So the question I had, um, you know, there's been so much chaos and crisis happening that oftentimes there are big issues that have already taken place that will impact our present and will continue to impact us beyond the election. One such um, issue that I think has been ignored a little bit in the media is the fact that on September 22nd, President Trump signed an executive order forbidding and banning all federal agencies from having any discussions that has to do with systemic oppression, specifically racism, um, gender-based bias, implicit bias, anything that has really to do with the issues that are so prevalent to the concerns and are so integrated to the some of the problems that have already been um, lifted up by this amazing panel that you put together. And I was just wondering for, from the, the panelist perspective, that how does this impact you as a young person when you see what the administration has been able to get away with and how has that motivated, inspired your continued action? Leslie, let me start with you, please. This is a really important question because all the advancements and progress that we have made so far around questions of diversity, inclusion, inclusive leadership, all these really important relevant areas which take place in offices and private corporations at the university levels, state university levels, you know, now are in jeopardy, right? The federal government, which is the largest employer in many ways, has, you know, if with this mandate, you can't have these training sessions anymore. You can't actually make, have these conversations because you'll be in violation of. So how do you see some of these issues, Leslie? You know, what, what is the impact of this kind of uh, order from the president on the work that you do or how you see diversity inclusion practices playing out? Well, I think that this exact passing of executive order is a true example of why we should keep fighting. These orders are passed and these restrictions are placed in organizations that want to improve and that want to progress so that white supremacy could stay in power, so that gender inequity could remain, so that racial injustice could still be in play in big organizations. And I think that this prevents any inclusion and any um, progression into the social justice that we're trying to reach. This prevents anyone who is trying to achieve equity in their corporations or in their programs go further into the field that they would like to with more diverse people and more and create a more diverse government. And I think that having this restriction and knowing that these things are being prevented from organizations and companies to do, I think that it's so much more important for us to speak louder, to do more advocacy, to do more than what we're already doing. Because it obviously shows that it is being brought to attention and it's scaring them which is why these executive orders are placed. They're realizing that the government is being more diverse. They're realizing that there are more representatives that look like us. So with them having fear, we know that we have them in the palm of our hands. We know that we're create, instilling that fear in them. So I think that having and seeing the injustices that are currently happening and that are being advocated for, I think that we should create more advocacy and keep fighting for it because it's working. And I think that it's more inspiring and that we're almost there. Although there's a restriction, a huge restriction placed, I think that the more we advocate and the more urgency we place on this, the more equitable we can make our society. 
Leslie, thank you. Jake, I wonder if you can speak to how uh, NYCLU's work, anti-racist work or mobilizing trainings might be constrained, especially if you're working with public organizations uh, because of this executive order. Yeah, I think um, for us in particular, a lot of the organizations that we work with are not necessarily public. Um, we don't actually work with a lot of the public organizations. So a lot of the agencies that are federal that would be that would be affected by the executive order, thankfully, are, we would not be affected um, by that executive order. But I do see the issue of of what that executive order would do and how that would create problems. And it's just another way to keep people from confronting the truth about racism and, and white supremacy in this country. And I think that one of the things that um, we we do as an organization is we do, we do conduct outreach to the community and let them know about our workshops and trainings. And so um, I think that this could be an opportunity if the federal government is not providing the trainings to explore the options of getting outside, um, you know, organizations to to come in like the ACLU, like the NYCLU, to come in and do some of these workshops, anti-oppression, oppression, uh, you know, trainings for these groups, because I think that that's something that we can and should explore. Um, this is actually the first time that I'm hearing about this executive order, so I'm glad that it was brought up. And I think that it's something that we can, um, as an organization, you know, look into and find out ways to to support these groups that are that are not going to be able to receive the important trainings and and the, and the skills that they need to do their work effectively, because I think that that should be honestly a part of the onboarding and the hiring of those people that they should actually have to undergo those trainings. It's something that we have to do at our organization. We have to take um, a number of different anti oppression trainings. So um, I think that it's something that's important and I and I'm wondering about the ways that we can explore how to support those groups that are not going to be able to receive the important the important work that they that needs to be done so certainly federal agencies but i imagine also universities that you know yeah. that receive federal monies um, mm -hmm. corporations now who are off the hook where they don't have to kind of implement some of these measures yeah. so this is a this is definitely a very regressive measure and it turns the clock back on um you know having these conversations and employees everywhere i mean there are surveys being done in corporations where employees everywhere are actually wanting they have responded to their uh, you know to their bosses surveying them to say that they want these conversations they think it's going to have an impact in their community they want it for themselves as employees they want it in the customers and client bases that the corporations serve and they want it in the larger community so they see the corporation actually playing a role in moving the needle on having more conversation, more uh, kind of uh, an acknowledgement of implicit biases that then have institutional manifestations and so on. So this is actually a, a very uh, overwhelming and a, an a area of concern. Devashish, if I could turn to you on the same question, please. Yeah, of course. Thank you. And this is such an important question, too. I noticed um, Donald Trump actually mentioned um, something about this executive order at the debate, um, referring to the curriculum of these um, sort of programs as racist curriculums, right? And so I think what this really speaks to, and, and it really does energize um, myself especially, uh, and, and Generation Z as a whole, because it really is, is the beacon and a prime example of how this country has a real issue reckoning with its history and reconciling with its history with race and racial inequity. And in these spaces, in, in conversations about diversity and inclusion and equity, I think it's also really important to remember that for um, the few people of color that are in these spaces, right? What what does that culture look like, right? There might be um, uh, a minimal amount of, of Black and Indigenous or people of color in, in certain spaces, right? Whether there is a diversity inclusion sort of um, movement in that office space is, is not the important part. It's about what does the culture look like, right? Because these these uh, very same people might feel uh, feel so many microaggressions, feel so many different things that um, are, are, are really difficult to capture in anti-oppression work workshops um, that are that are led by corporations specifically. So I think, um, like Jake alluded to, I think it's really important to think about um, what does what do anti oppression and anti racism workshops look like, right? It looks like hiring activists of color, it looks like hiring, right, centering the most appropriate voices that are willing to offer up their labor that 
they should be paid for their labor as well. It's really important to remember that. But those that are willing to offer their labor, like the Dream Defenders, right, organizations um, that are across the country willing to, to hold these workshops are going to be more important in this upcoming, um, uh, the next four years especially. Um, but to hold these conversations are really difficult. And to hold them appropriately is, is just uh, is just another, another layer to it. And I think it's really important, again, um, in every step of the decision-making process in diversity, whether whether we talk about um, the future of, of a company or, or the future of a work culture, right? Um, it's so important to, uh, to center the voices of those that are historically marginalized and experiencing the direct impacts of policies themselves. Vashish, thank you. Got two couple of really interesting questions on the types of organizations. Peter, I wonder if we can kind of combine a couple of those, please. Sure. So we have two questions. Well, first one is from Stephen Gubran, who asks, what advice would you give to progressive activists in 2020 who are eager to do something but are unsure of what to do or where to start? And in a similar vein, Savannah Yusko asks, what are some of your favorite youth organizations and social justice groups that you support? Senzile, let me start with you, please. Sorry, I was just rereading the question. Um, what advice would you give for us? So I think, um, I think, well, in class we discussed leadership and how um, many youth believe that leadership can't start within or can't start within their own community and where um, issues derive there. So I believe that, um, let me go back to the question, sorry. So for example, we looked at welfare rights um, initiative, it provides students, like it provides students with advocacy training and leadership training on issues that are directly affecting them. So a lot of people in my class um, have brought to our attention like issues about immigration, issues about access to education, issues about welfare assistance. So starting at those core issues within our communities that we see are prevalent and that we see many of us are going through, but may not be actively speaking on it. I think those are the main areas where we should start on issues. Great, hey, Leslie, let me turn to you please about your favorite organizations and the kinds of issues that, you know, progressive causes that you want to be involved in and would advocate for others to be involved in as well. Sure, um, so one of my favorite organizations is actually the one that Jake advocates for and it's the NYCLU. And so the NYCLU is basically, um, it's, it allows students and college students and high school students to um, advocate and promote social issues that affect everyone really. And so what the NYCLU does is that it educates each, um, each student or each person that would like to volunteer and work for these programs. And then we are taught to, um, to effectively advocate. We're taught to get trained on issues that um, we're able to change or make a difference in. And then we are actually um, supported through help with the workshops and the trainings that we do in our college campuses or in high school that, um, that educate other people to do um, social justice and advocate for um, issues like those. In terms of the um, suggestion on like what harsh progressives could do to um, advocate for things. I think it's important to first start off by educating people that are very um, closed-minded. So I think a lot of um, the reason why America has like, divide, divide, sorry, um, one of the reasons why the deviation of addressing social justice and racism and gender inequity and environmental injustice um, is that we like Americans aren't educated enough to see that there is a huge barrier for vulnerable people. And when we educate people on why it is that people are being affected on how we are actually doing things on our everyday lives that are affecting these people impacts them on a, on a huge basis. And so I think that instead of just placing our ideas and instead of just saying that everything should be done, I think that we need to advocate for a more calm and educated manner to educate other people to listen because I think that's something that's not being done right now. And we Gen Zers are 
seen as a uh, very harsh and radical and you know we want things our way and we want to change the world but none of that is being done because people don't listen and i think that when we take a step back and we educate calmly and we allow other people to understand us and we ourselves we listen to others and we educate ourselves on other issues that affect other people that aren't ours i think it's important for us to do that to prevent or to actually advocate for more progressiveness and to get things done hey raisa hi i mean i think uh, in terms of organizations i'm biased i grew up in a community organization it's an arts and social justice nonprofit called el puente based in williamsburg we are 38 years old and i am a strong proponent for the arts so at el puente we really utilize the power of the arts and arts as a universal language to reach bigger audiences and really touch people in places where, you know, regular, maybe a panel doesn't reach them, but seeing an art piece on police brutality will. Um, I am also a strong, strong supporter of Unlocal. Um, one of my bestest friends is working there right now. And Unlocal is a community centered organization that basically provides legal representation and community education um, to New York City's undocumented immigrant communities. Um, Center for Urban Pedagogy is another great place that I apply for an internship for, but then the internship got canceled because of COVID. Um, but they are sort of an urban planning, uh, community planning organization that also utilizes the arts. Um, in terms of really, getting a start especially for youth our in our age cohort that you know are seeing injustices everywhere and almost feel hopeless it really starts with just finding a friend if you find a, a one another one other friend who you know is equally as upset about everything that's going on in the world you two are you know gathering resources online social media instagram TikTok, whatever and you feel so compelled like they say in, in colleges if you want to start a club find a friend and find a a mentor, but you don't, you, to start an organization, you don't even need to do that. Here at Box the Ballot, um, my friend and the founder of uh, BTV, Daphne, she just went ahead and, and started it. And then now she, because we're expanding, asked some of her activist friends. Um, I know Daphne from high school, but um, she's also directed the New York Director for March for Our Lives, which is also another amazing youth led movement um, and utilize her network. I think, you know, just because someone's maybe just your friend they also everybody has opinions and everybody can feel really strongly about something and so i think partnerships and coalitions you know if you have five friends who want to start something they also have five friends and those five friends also have five friends so i think the power of networking especially when we have social media in our hands is immense and vast um and really empowering and i think that you know if we use social media for social networking we can also use it for great um links for activism Okay, so thank you. There was she's quite, quite, uh, the same question about uh, social movement causes and organizations that you support or others that you might encourage to support. Yeah, of course. So I think you guys are going to notice a common theme in the organizations that I that I love to support. But I think one of my favorites is the Student Farm Worker Alliance, which is an organization that organizes with migrant, indigenous, black and brown farm workers across the country. Um, and it's migrant farm workers asking for their working conditions to to be better, right? So like like centering the appropriate voices. Organiz organizations that highlight this um, are, are really important to engage with. So I love the Student Farm Worker Alliance. I love United We Dream, uh, the Sun rise movement youth action for alliance uh youth alliance um uh, uh justice democrats right these are these are some some really interesting organizations that are pushing uh pushing policy discourse in in a really really interesting direction and and leslie uh, alluded saying that a lot of people find these ide ideas radical they find them un like unaccomplishable right but i think um We've gotten so far, uh, I think, in, in terms of our policy discourse because of these uncomfortable ideas, because of these bold envisioning strategies that that um, incredible youth or youth organizations are offering. Right. We're dreaming of a new world. And that's a common uh, that's a common theme that um, that a lot of these organizations um, have as well. They're all dreaming for a new world. And I think uh, the more 
the more we push the more we push policy discourse um to to match sort of the the, the pulse of our nation right now the better we're, the better we're off and so again to just like to allude um and answer that the part about what do you do right it's it's we stand um as as students we stand on the shoulders of giants there are incredible student activists and student organizers that come before us that will come after us right and there's so much resource sharing that can be done um and so all it really takes like raisa so eloquently put is is just finding finding a cause that you're just inspired by motivated by angered by right whatever emotion you're feeling channel that into how you can sort of push for a way to change to challenge to to question what's going on so i think it literally just takes one friend one one cause and 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 then take it from there Rashish thank you you know your all of your comments lead me to a question that i have which is you know the notion of protest dissent civil disagreement right are essential elements of a robust democracy jake i wonder if i could start with you please how do you train young people to participate in protests and to to continue this really important core of voicing disagreements but in a civil manner what where are there spaces and opportunities and what did you see over the summer yeah the nyclu has a protest training um particularly we particularly that we deliver to the community um we deliver that for for everyone for students teachers parents in the school community but we also go outside of the schools and and deliver it to the broader community as well and within our training um prior to covid uh we delivered their trainings in person and we would inform people about what their rights are when coming into contact with police their rights uh to videotape and to um and to record um protests um the certain types of signs that they can bring to a protest and all the different new york city specific and new york state laws um there are two different trainings that we offer because the city has different laws than the broader new york state so local ordinances you know local communities have different guidelines so our training looks differently depending on where we are in new york but for us specifically when working with young people i think um it's really important to share not only what their rights are but also we talk to them about um how to protect themselves when out in the streets we know and we have seen um the ways that police have been treating protesters specifically this summer um and a lot of our trainings you know right now we're not actually encouraging we're not encouraging folks to go out as part of the NYCLU to protest um not only because of covid but because of safety and and wanting to ensure the safety of our of our program participants but we are training them if they do decide to go out and protest like what their rights are and specifically how to keep themselves safe during covid so i think that right now with regard to protests i think there's a lot of concerns about um the election as well and what will happen and and we're expecting and anticipating regardless of the outcome that there will still be protests um and so i think with with our youth um we're we're still in conversations about what that might look like later on this year but i think that um you know the trainings that we offer specifically um have been tailored to the environment that we're in now and i think that's something that we are encouraging um folks to sign up for when we do deliver them on campuses and school communities so um i think that right now that's kind of where where we're going in the in the direction of providing zoom zoom trainings on protest rights great thank you uh i want to turn to the next question peter from daphne but one more question here uh from daphne frias asks uh what are some tips for beginning uh intergenerational conversations on hard topics like racism So we've definitely touched on this but I wonder if we can talk a little bit that you know along with the work and the activism that you're doing you're also trying to create you know new areas of dialogue right sort of really create new uh places of value changes um talk to us a little bit about how you might be doing this in your own way whether you're talking about you know trying to talk to your parents or talk to neighbors or other members of your community who might not be might not vote in the same direction that you do um you know what are some of those conversations that you're having Leslie let me start with you please sure um so i think that um it has been a bit challenging to bring these topics of discussion to my family um just because um especially in the political climate that we're in 
um, they're, they're a little, their generation is different than mine. So um, they have different viewpoints on different things. And um, I think that having these conversations are definitely hard with people that don't align with your beliefs exactly or that see the benefits of believing in other things. Um, but I think having the conversation in general is extremely important, even if there isn't an agreement or even if there isn't understanding um, because people that aren't aware or aren't um, experiencing these issues firsthand should recognize that there's an issue to begin with, even if they don't align with it, even if they don't understand. So I think that it is definitely hard and that it is something that it is it is our duty to have these conversations, even if they're difficult. And I think that making these conversations difficult is the reason why we need to have them because um, they're obviously not approached or they're not um, discussed enough, which is why they don't understand. And I think that starting with the conversation, even if there's um, shaming, even if there's fear, even if there's uh, not understanding, um, or even if there's a little bit of feud, it's okay. There's still people, um, even if it's not just your family, having these conversations is important to raise urgency, to raise awareness, to raise advocacy. And it's it's not in just Gen Z's hands, it's in everyone's. And it's not in just um, social justice issues, it's in all issues that affect not just us, but everyone. So I think that the topics might be hard and the discussion and the backlash might be hard. But I think that's exactly why we need to have these conversations. Thank you. Zensile. So I believe um, it's important to start at debunking certain stereotypes, stigmas, and myths that um, continue to perpetuate in our communities. I think a great way to do that is also by revisiting our history and looking within our textbooks and trying to bring a broader narrative when constructing and when writing our history. I think um, a lot of the history books that were presented in school is pretty much focused on the white narrative. So I think being more inclusive in the certain narratives of um, history and culture and just being open-minded to certain, um, to different cultures and different belief systems will be a great way to direct us in a new conversation of bringing more change, bringing more social justice, bringing more racial equity within our schools and society. Thank you so much, Raisa. I had plenty of these conversations. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think the first step to this is realizing that sometimes you can't change people's minds. And I had to learn that the hard way. It's really hard when there's someone that you care about that just doesn't see eye to eye with you. It's a big part of it is knowing where you have to stand down and step back and say, okay, I can't approach this conversation because this person isn't willing to listen to what I have to say. You know, I think approaching these conversations, what I've seen is the most effective, but also recognizing that this isn't always the case. You can't always have a space of compassion for somebody. What if it's like a heckler on the street and you have, and they're attacking you for X, Y, and Z and, and whatever, whatever, that you feel less compelled to want to change that person's mind. But when it's someone that you care about, it gets a little trickier. Um, I've, I've been privileged enough to grow up in a family of activists who already know. I don't have to really explain much to them. But you know, when I'm, let's say, talking with my grandmother and I have to explain you know, what being non-binary and transgender looks like and what, what that experience is and just having her understand what that means. My grandmother is a Catholic Puerto Rican woman born the great, during the Great Depression. The paradigm shift for her that has to occur can't be done on a societal level. It has to be from a place of compassion and understanding and explaining to her like, grandma, sometimes people are born. And also sometimes the more complicated and the more like uh, woke jargon, if you will, we incorporate into things, it starts to alienate people who aren't within these circles and who aren't hit, right? If you don't know, uh, I can't blanking on an example right now, it's like, that doesn't mean anything to you. And so you really have to, in my opinion and in my experience is approach conversations and I don't want to say create a safe space because we've talked about this in Shama's class and the problematic nature of that 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 word um, and, and that that scenario but just really creating especially for the people that you want to have these conversations with and who maybe you even notice that like 
it's not that they're bigoted. It's not that they're hateful. They're just a little bit ignorant and they just don't know. And, you know, when you're sitting here and pointing like fingers at people saying, oh, like you're, you're transphobic period. That's not going to make someone want to, to learn and to grow and to change. I think cancel culture is really, really aiding that right now, the fuel to the fire of like, people can't change. And if you say one thing, that's it. Like it's clipped. That's not helpful for growth. Um, and I think creating spaces where you can have dialogue with let's say family, friends or neighbors or, or community members where you can kind of uh, bring into light where you're coming from and then they can do the same. It really allows for some, some productive dialogue that transcends the socio-political nature of things and, and sort of brings in the humanistic um, aspect to it. And universities are made for this, right? This is exactly, you have a classroom, you, it is a sacred space. That's what I would, I'd like to call it, where there, there is a, a area of discourse and interaction and trust and faith. Um, and I think this, this is exactly where some of these kinds of uh, areas can be revisited, including curricular, right, issues, or, you know, what we read, who we identify as sources of authority and what kind of narrative, what history, you know, all history is political and what we choose to pull out um, is truly kind of, you know, there's a, there's a sense of agency there. So I think, you know, where we can all make a difference as students, as young people, as instructors, as professors, is trying to kind of forward and advance those, some of those difficult conversations. So not safe spaces, but definitely an uncomfortable space that we'd like to think about. Um, Devashish, if I could uh, turn to you quickly as well, and then Jake. Yeah, so I think uh, Raisa uh, touched on a lot of points that I would have definitely brought up, but like, uh, it's important to remember that these conversations are really, really uncomfortable, right? So I think my motto is to lean into the discomfort. And I really like leaning into the discomfort to a certain extent, though, I'll, I'll give that caveat, especially because a lot of disagreements um, may come from uh, disagreements about certain people's identities, certain people's um, ethnicity, certain people's uh, sort of existence, right? And when those disagreements are rooted in that, it becomes a little bit of a difficult um, conversation to navigate because those very same um, uh, identities may intersect with your own identities, right? And so that, that conversation about self-care is also really important when we're talking about these really difficult conversations, because uh, if you're engaging in a conversation with someone who is, who is theorizing something that may be a difficult and direct impact on your own life, whether, whether it's an immigration policy that you've seen in your own life affect you, some person may be able to talk about it in a theoretic framework but but it has really real life implications on you and it could be traumatic often these conversations if you keep having if you keep having them if you keep engaging with in, in these sorts of conversations so it's really important a to remember lean into the discomfort but also recognize when to take care of yourself and when to prioritize your own uh, mental health in, in in these situations because that labor shouldn't be on you that labor should be on the person it's the onus is on the person to do that that research is to do that that digging and you should be sort of kicking them off into that direction especially if it's someone that you care about if it's a loved one right and another like aspect that that we have to think about is also checking our own biases so um Zenzile also so eloquently put about um thinking about uh, the, the, the stereotypes that are perpetuated in, in, in societies and schools, right? And even as and us as Gen Z, as activists, even the most engaged students have to always participate in that process of learning and unlearning, right? Because these systems are in so entrenched. We keep talking about that in, in, in this context, but they're so entrenched and they become implicitly internalized at, into us as students without even realizing it. So not only do we have to check others, but we have to constantly and consistently check ourselves, check our own biases and check our own uh, stereotypes that we may perpetuate without even meaning to, right? So intention is also an important layer, I would add, uh, whether we know that we're well intentioned and someone might, might not be as well intentioned, right? But sort of, it, it's all about this process of learning and unlearning that, that we all have to engage in. Thank you. And Jake, personally, you know, as well as professionally at the NYCLU, how are you advocating for these difficult conversations? 
Yeah, I, I actually, I really appreciate what everyone was just saying, specifically Devashish was what he, what you were saying, because I feel like a lot of that was what I was going to say in particular <laughs> with like the difficult conversations. And like, I think it's important to have those conversations. And I think um, in our programs, obviously, like we, a lot of the people that are in the programs and a lot of the young people, like they, they, they actually have raised it. The problem is that everybody agrees with each other. So there's actually not really those conversations that are happening because people that are joining our programs are typically people that already advocate for the issues and they're trying to find new ways to even go further than that. But when thinking about like, in particular from my personal experience, like on my dad's side of my family, they're all Trump supporters and I've tried these conversations with them. Um, and I've tried to have conversations with them about these issues and why they matter. And they are not, they just will not accept it. And I think what, what was just said about like, you have to also take care of yourself. And at some point, like there's just certain things that you, you can't have a conversation with someone who's not going to believe. Like I will have a conversation with you about LGBTQ rights, but at the end of the day, if you don't believe that my humanity matters, like I'm not gonna waste my time having a conversation with you. Like it feels like there's sometimes you have, you can have a conversation, but then at other times, like my, my, my identity is not for debate. So I think that's part of why these conversations are important. And you can lean in on empathy, right? Like you can build relationships and try to get people to understand like the people that you, you know, you know, you know a gay person or you know a, a person of color, like you can, you can do that, but there are people that you're gonna, that you're gonna encounter that are just not going to change their opinions. And at that point, you just have to respectfully walk away for the sake of your own um, mental health. Um, and I've done that. I've had plenty of conversations about why President Trump is problematic, why he, has done so many horrible things and I've gone through that and my family will still, some people will still vote for him. And I'm just like, at that point, like, I just have to walk away. Like your mental health is not worth trying to have a conversation with someone who is literally not going to change their, their opinion. So I know that that's not necessarily the right, you know, not always the answer that people want to hear, but at some point, like you just have to kind of, it, it, it's not worth it. It's, it's <laughs> self-preserved as well. It, it, it yeah. goes back to our previous discussion about, you know, where do you draw the line, right? Yeah. And, and how do you take care of yourself? So folks, we're almost at time and I want to um, give everyone literally 30 seconds, right? We've got an election looming ahead. It is singularly one of the most important uh, responsibilities that we all have is to vote. But it is also a defining time because so many of the relevant questions and issues that you brought up are up for debate and discussion and how we vote and the outcome this year will set the stage for many actions for, for generations. Um, so I'm gonna give you all literally 30 seconds to have a call to action. From your vantage point, what is the one big issue that we have to move in, we have to lean into between now and the election? This is not to discount the fact that post elections, irrespective of who wins, we've got a lot of work to be done and we didn't even touch on that, the work that continues. But I'm gonna give you all a chance to talk about the most important issue that you care about and what your call to action to your generation or to anybody else who's listening today can be. So I'm going to start with Leslie, please. So one of the issues that I feel like should be focused a little more on is the environmental justice movement, um, because it addresses everything that we're trying to fight for in the social justice movement. It involves racial injustice, it involves gender inequity, it involves um, environmental vulnerability, and it involves um, income, um, jobs, it involves um, mental health, it involves everything. And I think that that's a huge issue that isn't being addressed. And it's something that we need to advocate more of even after the elections because it addresses and it benefits everyone. Desi, thank you. Zenzile. Um, my takeaway point would just be um, the big issue for me would be universal health care, especially during this time of COVID-19. Being around, um, a lot of people may not have access to the resources that they need, and even mental health. Um, there's a lot of um, issues that are being brought to the light since COVID, and I think it's also taking a toll on a lot of us having to still work, having to still um, um, go to school, having to still 
take care of our personal needs. So I think universal health care will ensure that everyone has the health care they need to continue to progress and be a better person. Sanjali, thank you. Raisa. Vote. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my thing, vote. And, and, you know, I understand that a lot of people my age aren't voting for uh, numerous reasons, whether, you know, they don't, they don't want to add to the broken machine and, and are, you know, abolitionists and, and don't believe in reform. Or if you do believe in reform and you do want to vote in your Democratic Party, I just think it's so important to vote for the people who can't vote. And that's what we say a lot at Box the Ballot. Vote for you know, let's say, okay, you don't want to vote for whatever reason, right? But think about the people, there's so many people in this country that can't vote. If you're an ex-convict, if you are an immigrant, uh, undocumented immigrant, if you, you know, if you can't, if you are, I'm trying to think of another person who might not be able to vote. Anyways, if you can vote, if you can vote and you are able to vote, it's, it's just so important to vote for the people that can't because the people that can't vote will be most affected by, you know, this, this upcoming administration. Vote as if you know, you're protecting all the people who are unprotected under the law. Raisa, thank you. Devashish. Yeah, I think I would just uh, highlight all of what Raisa just said, as well as add um, that uh, immigration affects every single person in this country, whether you know it or not, whether it's you or whether it's someone you know, or whether it's someone in your circle, it has very direct and real implications. Immigration is one of those policies that is really difficult to talk about because it's human lives, right? It's human lives at stake. But to be human is to migrate, to be to, to participate in, in migration, whether whether it's it's legal or illegal migration, right? Is, is, is one of the most boldest thing you can do in this in this world, right? And so I would ask everyone to sort of it, to engage with the organizations uh, that, that are doing the amazing work in your communities. And, and if there's not like any organization doing the amazing work, then do the amazing work yourself. Kick that off. Find network, tap into your network, right? There's so many different ways to go about bringing the change you want to see. And, and it, it, all, it only takes just one person to do that. Devashish, thank you. Jake. Yeah, I would say in addition to voting, create a, create a plan, a voting plan. I think it's important to anticipate possible barriers to your accessing your vote. So find out where your polling place is, um, bring five friends with you, or create a, create a plan with five friends um, to identify your polling place, how you're going to vote, right? So by mail, um, are you going to vote in person? Are you going to vote on election day? Um, and then create you know, an outline of what you're gonna be doing after the election. Um, how do you plan to respond to, the, to, to who's president? How are you gonna get involved? Um, and what are you gonna be doing? But I think having a plan is really important because there's obviously like, if you wait until election day, um, things come up, not only in, like in your life, but also like things that come up with your polling site. So just be prepared um, and really have an action plan for what you're going to be doing um, with your vote. Jake, thank you so much. So everyone, we're at time now and we must end. I want to thank all the panelists for their, for their vibrancy, for their thoughts, for their clarity of intention and purpose. I feel so energized as an old person listening to this conversation today. I am grateful to you all for your candid thoughts, the great questions that came from the audience. And to those of you who are listening and were unable to ask a question, I hope some of these discussions were enlightening to you as well. So thank you all again. A recording of this discussion will be made available on our website. So we will be happy to also send it out to all those who are on the list today. So thank you all and please vote. And if you're not registered to vote, go out there and get yourself registered to vote and we will all see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.